full screen this guy. There we go. All right. Um, kind of start this idea uh, to take a look at the coin defenseman in standard in hockey. I'll show you in a few slides. Typically, you'll see a roster. Uh, we've got 12 forwards, three lines, or four lines of four, three forwards, and then uh, six defensemen. And that's the typical structure you see in hockey, and it's been like that for quite a few years. Um, and I noticed, I think it was two years ago, uh, Tampa Bay Lightning had run a structure where they were running only 11 forwards and seven defensemen, and they had some success with it. And I was just kind of curious if this was something they had done more often. It was something I noticed in the playoffs. So I went back and took a look to see how often they were doing this, when they were doing this, and um, what kind of success, if it was some sort of advantage that they um, were able to find in this, this new roster, if it was something that maybe fit their team, or if it was something you could kind of translate uh, across the board. And uh, like I said, here's, here's the actually uh, article I got the idea um, with this unorthodox lineup. And um, again, it was the date here, so it was a 2014-15 season. Um, when people started to notice it, but as I took a dive into the data, uh, it was curious to find what I found. Um, again, like I said, this is the typical structure. We would have the 12 forwards and six, and they were going here, where, um, and then they would double shift a forward. Um, and then, you know, so there's some advantages there, but also some, um, some disadvantages, but uh, it seemed to work for them that year. So what we're going to go through is just I'm going to look and see if there's any sort of performance difference between the two roster structures. Um, I took all the game data for the Lightning between 2010 and 16, and um, just our objective here is just to go through and see if there's you know something measurable uh, to quantify. And then here's a quick outline for everyone. I uh, broke it down season by season here. You can get an idea. Um, this 12-13 season was a lockout shortened season. They only played, I think they started the season in January, so there's only 48 games there. Uh, so you can see the discrepancy between uh, the standard 82 game season, but um, you know, overall, a good idea of 179 out of the 523 games, um, I think it was about 34%. So, I, like I said, I found this article and it was just based on this, solely this column here. Um, with uh, the playoffs there in that year. But once I kept looking at you know, I was finding more and more, and all the way back, um, I started to go back to the 13 14 season. I talked to one of the analysts for Lightning, and he said, Yeah, go back, you know, about three seasons. And um, then last fall, I was discussing this with some people at a conference, and um, shortly after my presentation, the coach of the Auto Centers right now. Guy Boucher, he was the coach of the Lightning um, from 2010 to 2013. And um, he had a press conference before the season started in Ottawa, it was his first year there, and uh, just discussed his interest or intrigue with this format. So I'm sitting there thinking in this conference, I have all this data pull up for these three seasons, and I'm like, I think I just missed three seasons of data. So I should turn off, I, I go home and I run the data, and when that coach Guy Boucher was there in 2010-2013, uh, um, as you can see, it, it, it's been going on longer than the three years that I originally kind of explored. Um, and then some of the kind of topics we'll focus on, uh, just was curious how, you know, if this was something that was because of an injury that they were forced into maybe adapting their roster. Um, you know, take a look at that. And then see how it affects the distribution of the ice time. Are the forwards, you know, they logging a lot more minutes now that there's only 11? Um, how much does it help the defenseman? Is it really decreasing their ice time? Are they, um, you know, seeing any benefit there? And then just going through some you know, stats to kind of play it out and see, you know, what can we find if there's that advantage. Uh, this chart looks a little bit confusing at first, but basically each line here on the chart represents a game. Um, so through that six-year span, uh, there's a line for each individual game, uh, and as you can see, it's broken down with the seven defensemen on the bottom, and he's game with 70s across here, and then the 60 across the top, and um, like ironically enough, the season that I, the only season I noticed it, where I picked up the idea, was right here in 2014-15, and as you can see, um, 
it was only a short period uh, concentrated area where they had run this structure. So, and that actually lined up with the playoffs. If we go back here, you can see uh, in that same season they hadn't run it all in the in the regular season. And we'll explore that a little bit. And like I said, so this, this is kind of what I was just re referencing, and um, <coughs> especially related to the injuries and maybe you know, strategy versus you know a necessity. Um, and uh, this, I only I'll post up two slides here with the injuries. Um, the other four, I, there there wasn't a real direct correlation um, between injuries and, and the time period where they were using them, but. I found it kind of uh, interesting if you go up there uh, to when they're using the 7D and you come straight down, um, their top forward, Steven Stamkos, lines up pretty closely um, with that same time period. Um, so keep that in mind, this is their top forward. I mean, he's just got a new contract last year, and, uh, one of the top players in the league. So uh, it was kind of another interesting variable once I noticed that. And then look at, you know, trying to look into the numbers. Um, you know, you're kind of thinking if they're top players out, you know, is it going to have that measurable advantage? Uh, I'm curious, or, you know, how that will affect things. And then, again here, um, it not as clear, uh, quite as clear, but if you go, uh, this kind of section here was the second, I think it was the uh, 20 through 40 games, there's also any, uh, the chart here, it's kind of lit uh, key on it, but you can see the defensemen uh, are in red and then the forwards in blue, and you can kind of see there uh, a little bit of a correlation with those seven defensemen lineups um, in that second quarter of the season. Kind of lineup where they had a big period of injuries as well. Um, some definitely some contributors, but uh, Stamkos, that, that top player there, uh, wasn't affected in this, this series. But take a look. And then, like I mentioned, uh, the time on ice, I was kind of curious. They're um, switching and they have an extra defenseman. How does that change the distribution uh, of the ice time? And you can see here, it was able to you know, decrease the overall ice time and, and distribute it uh, a little more throughout the lineup. And there were certain games, um, they had a player, Nikita Nesterov, I think he's back in playing in the KHL now in Russia, but he was more of an offensive specialist for them, so uh, when they would dress him oftentimes, um, the word games were he would only get a minute or so of playing time because if they were, um, had a lead and they're trying to protect this lead, uh, he was used you know, in, in a more offensive specialty role uh, for the power play or when they're you know, spending a lot of time down. So um, it wasn't quite as even across the board, there were definitely instances where, like I said, that se seventh defenseman was uh, almost like a specialty player. Um, but for the most part, uh, it was something that kind of helped decrease and kind of more evenly distribute their ice time. And then for the forwards here, uh, you know, I wasn't sure how that would affect things with one less forward. Um, they're going to have to double shift one player every cycle through the lineup. So I'm just curious how that would affect things. And you can see there's a slight increase overall in this boxing whisker plot here where uh, the median increases, the actual figures over there, um, about a minute. But overall, uh, the general range is, is you know, remains pretty similar. So uh, as far as fatigue factor, it's, it's hard to say, but um, there was no giant you know, discrepancy between the two. And we'll start here, and I'll, I'll go through the stats with you. Some of you might not be as familiar with all of them, but um, the, the top uh, section here is a stat called Corsi, uh, and that includes, in hockey, a shot on goal is defined as any shot that results in a save or a goal. Um, but with Corsi, uh, Corsi includes any missed shots or any block shots, which a shot on goal would include. So uh, I can increase the sample size and kind of change uh, or, or allow you to analyze things in a little different way. And then going down through, we have Fenwick, which is this um, similar to Corsi, but instead of shots, missed shots, and block shots, it's only shots and missed shots. Block shots are not included in Fenwick. And then scoring chances, um, from the, in this particular instance, um, I'm trying to remember the, the characteristics they were included, but a scoring chance, um, right now it's kind of 
very, can vary um, from team to team or analyst to analyst or even website to website. It's uh, uh, defined by certain characteristics, maybe the shot location, the distance from the goal, uh, the type of shot, if it's a, a redirect, a rebound, a wrist shot, a slap shot, um, a one-timer, um, maybe the angle of the goal if they're you know, right, just coming right straight down the slot or if it's you know, from an outsider angle. Um, you know, there's a number of factors, but typically uh, the most common description I've come across is there's a home plate area uh, you can define on the ice, and that would be if you can picture like the face-off dot on either side, and then the goal, so you draw a line across the face-off dots, and then down to the bottom of the circle, the face-off circle, and then over to the crease, so it kind of makes like a home plate shape. Um, and that's a common uh, area that's outlined as a scoring chance area, and then plus like a rush if it's a you know two on one, three on one, three on two, any sort of odd man rush, uh, breakaway stuff like that. But uh, we'll start with those three. As you can see, uh, going through, um, you know, even going back where I said in that one season, 2013-14, they had Steven Stamkos was out for a, you know extended period of time when they were using this, and I was kind of not sure how it would turn out, but. Um, in the, the Corsi 4 uh, results, so the shots 4 they had, um, they saw an increase in 2. Um, the Corsi against, they saw an increase, which is a bad thing because these are shots against, so I label it in red, but as you can see the percentage, the 4 over the 4 plus against, um, overall still increased it, and it still increased overall. Um, and then something else I was trying to keep an eye on going through was just curious how it affected the game and the style of play. So if you see here, I, I included the total Corsi, Fenwick, and scoring chances. And i um, just curious how maybe the pace of play, if that's changed um, you know, throughout the different styles, if they're uh, defensemen, if they have an extra defenseman uh, that's more mobile and they're allowed to push the pace a little more, they don't have to worry about the fatigue factor if they've been they're distributing the ice time. So um, you know, if you're going through all the total stats there, Overall, they, they all saw an increase, and then on the next slide, I'll show you um, just ran some quick t tests to see the significance of each of these. Um, and then the final one here is uh, expected goals, and that is a model built. There's a couple of them out there, and they're built um, kind of on the similar characteristics to the scoring chance, but um, I guess I would describe it as if you took um, one way I had to describe it to me was if you went out to the rink and you, you shot the puck 10 times and, and you scored you know, 3 out of 10. And um, you're trying to extrapolate that into future projection. It, obviously, that wouldn't be um, you know, a great predictor of your, your future um, record. So what scoring, the expected goals model, um, you're able to take a collective amount of shots going through and um, you know, over time, whether it includes all those sort of characteristics and um, defining sort of the danger of each shot and the scoring chance uh, to give you a projected goal amount. Um, and again, here you can see the goals for went up, the goals against uh, increased slightly, but overall um, the percentages were favorable. And this one here, um, like I said, I just ran through uh, some t statistical tests. And um, the statistical testing, I, I just did a hypothesis test, a uh, t-test in the program I use, and uh, the key over there. So anything, um, the most significant values, which just kind of like a temperature coded scale uh, in green here. It's kind of hard to see with the projector. But uh, the smaller the amount, uh, the more significant that value. So you can kind of go through and see um, in yellow, and green or something, so I'm you know, looking through numbers uh, that I was kind of looking for. And um, at the end, I kind of summarize it and you'll kind of try to find a trend, like you know, which of these are you know, significant values, what can we kind of tease out of this. But um, you know, going through all the statistics for the team um, were definitely increased. Um, and, th and those were definitely good indicators uh, again, like the total chances, the pace of play, um, those are pretty significant throughout. So, and here's just some quick graphics to, to see it here visually. Um, with the Corsi, 
on top and the Fenwick on the bottom and, and just using the axis there to show the shots against and the shots for. Um, to, with some of the numbers so close and then trying to scale it, it, it's hard to see the difference, but with the labels, hopefully that helps, but just to give you some sort of visualization uh, for those stats. And again, here's those percentages going through. And then finally, the, the pace kind of related statistics. And then I um, kind of broke it down even further. I had, like I said, the, the team stats there, but I want to see how it affected the forwards as a group and the defenders as a group and how their play um, changed besides obviously we looked at the ice time, but what their play looked like in the two different samples. So um, I focused on the top six forwards. Uh, it was something I, you know, going through some tests and stuff, uh, they were more consistent, less changed throughout the lineup um, and everything. So it was uh, a little more steady to evaluate and um, going through with all the same t uh, stats here, you can see Actually, for this one, it's hard to see which ones are green. It's like a real light shaded green. Um, but again, all the, those that are green uh, were an increase. Um, if it's in red there, like the, the goals against, uh, obviously that's not a good thing, so just put it with a little red for you. And then um, down here, you can see for the expected goals against for both the top six and the, and the defense, um, they de decreased, which would be a bonus. So, and again, here we go through some some p-values to kind of show uh, significant levels of each of these tests and the results if the differentials are actually significant or if it's just some noise. Again, some quick uh, graphical representations. Slido, but it's a it's a presentation tool, and you can throw you can open it up for questions, and you can punch questions through a lot of you know, presenting, um, and you can kind of thumbs up or thumbs down to kind of see who's interested in what. If it's this question that is coming up, so I could do it throughout. But um, I'm not going to use it for that function. But I did upload this table, all the um, graphs and tables, the whole slideshow to that, and I. I have to write the code down, but I'll get you the code in a second, and then some of the stuff I'm going through, if you want to take a look at it, um, right away you can. And then some other things I took a look at statistically uh, were the zone entries. Um, this is stuff that's more um, manually tracked, and um, there was a, was a project uh, in 2014, uh, Coach Meyer went through and did all 1,200 games, and um, but for the games here, we broke it down. Um, there's a couple of stats that I wanted to look at that have been found to be most important as far as um, predicting future success. And um, the five, the five entry percentage would be, you know, as you're transitioning up the ice, what your success rate was entering into the zone with the possession. Um, and then entry can be defined as if you dump it in and you retrieve it, and then versus a or including carry-in, and then the carry-in would be separate, um, and the carry-in would be preferred and shown to be a little more a stronger future predictor of, of goals. So uh, you can see here, it's a small sample size, it was just one season, but um, those sort of stats really received a nice boost uh, with the seven defensemen. And then here, um, the passing project, there it's, it's limited right now in the amount of games, but it's something uh, they're doing another manual tracking project where uh, Ryan Simpson has started there and they're tracking every single pass for every game um, and they're trying to build as much data as they can, but what I was able to get from him uh, right here, as you can see, was 50, only 56 games for this season, but uh, again, this, and this A1 stat represents a primary pass setting up a shot, so it's the last shot, last pass before a shot, and then the SC is the last pass before a scoring chance shot. Um, and again, the, the PR squared values of, of that uh, two future success and goals and wins, those are two uh, stats that have been found 
pretty strong, and, and you can see the differences there. And then uh, the p values right here. So again, some of that's uh, sample size related and other things, but um, they're not terribly high. But again, uh, you don't see the fitness favorable. Uh, some of the stats up there with the, the carrying percentage, uh, they increase over when you're running the 60 format. And then again, just kind of summarize all the different between those uh, team, top six, defense, and then those zone entries and passing. Um, there's just a quick summary of uh, the p values on the different levels, um, you know, ranging from most significant to uh, lower significance but all within a pretty reasonable range for, for research here. So um, with the, <clears throat> the category that it stems from, and obviously the stat, so. And then, um, as I mentioned, I kind of started off the project, uh, the, the presentation where um, I only had looked into about three years of data because uh, I know Coach John Cooper was, was running this 7D format uh, quite often. But uh, once I added Guy Boucher, I was kind of curious how the numbers differ between the two coaches and if you know, systems related or, or just how uh, you know, they really will really utilize that format. So went through and um, same thing here, but I took out the 6 and 7 column and just showed the, the p-values, the si significance, uh, if there's an improvement or not between the 60 and 70 format, and as you can see with uh, John Cooper over here, the number's a little more favorable, but I think with down there's a, just a couple caveats on that. Um, the teams with John Cooper, they made uh, the playoffs three out of three seasons uh, when he was the full-time coach, um, and with Guy Boucher, they made the playoffs all at once. So, you know, some, some of this we've taken into account is the quality of the team, you know, between the, the differences here, but um, again, just a good test to kind of see, you know, digging into this measurable advantage that we're kind of trying to find out. And then a common question I, I get is, you know, so you're yeah. using Tampa Bay as an example, but are there other teams using this? Um, you know, is it more widespread than just Tampa? And uh, I kind of went through the, just this season I pulled up uh, the teams that have utilized it uh, in some shape or form throughout the year. As you can see, Tampa Bay had uh, 23 games this year. Um, there's a few teams here and there, like Minnesota, Philly, and Pittsburgh, they're on the lower end and um, going through it. And I know quite a few of those instances um, were back to injury related where they had a defender coming back and um, running the risk of having five defenders because the player comes in and um, he's not able to finish out the game because it's his first game back and something happens where aggravates the injury. Um, so more often than not, uh, you know, quite a few of those teams have lower usage. Those were often related to that sort of injury, injury strategy. So um, just to kind of give you a visual and, a, and an idea of, of other teams and, and if it's being used that often throughout the league. And, Something else interesting I found when I was trying to pull all these numbers, it got an error at one point. Um, but two teams used eight defenders uh, for one game each. So that was something kind of uh, scratching my head. And, and one of the gentlemen in, involved uh, with those teams is here today, so I'll have to, to ask a little bit. But I was curious, um, like I said, it was uh, either six or seven. There's kind of a limited sample of seven outside of Tampa. Um, and there were those kind of two outlier games. And then uh, just to wrap it up, uh, a couple a couple ideas for further exploration. Um, like I said, kind of going back to that time ice thing with the factor of fatigue and um, looking at more, more of an individual analysis on certain players and uh, throughout the season if, if uh, your defenders are logging heavy minutes and you're, you're top heavy on their own defense, you know, in the periods of time when you run this seven to kind of be able to ease up the minutes and and um, you know that factor of fatigue can can play a role or what role it does play uh, and then you know taking a little deeper dive into the injury analysis and um, maybe lining up more more closely uh, besides that chart there 
And then um, it would be ideal that the manual tracking stuff's great, but it's, it's really limited right now as far as the amount of data available. So um, to be able to dive into that uh, a little more, get some more data pulled, um, it'd be really interesting to be able to add that. And then again, uh, you know, that the coaching impact, that was something that um, I hadn't accounted for at first, but just see how, you know, obviously the, the roster structure, the impact of that, but then um, above and beyond, <coughs> the coaching structure and then how they um, structure their team and execute. And then finally, um, I guess like we saw earlier, uh, the pace of play seemed to uh, be a factor that was increasing. And um, it, it's hard to make any sort of conclusive statement uh, with the measurable advantage going through. Um, there's some great, good things that definitely catch your eye, but also other things are you know, not so sure. So. Uh, things like pace where we can see that there's a uh, pretty consistent uh, increase uh, looking into that and seeing if pace, you know, if there's some sort of advantage there when you're in a different pace of play. Um, intuitively, you would think if you, if you can control possession and you're um, out shooting the team in a game with 30 shots versus 75 shots, um, as far as your, your lead, like your chances a little better to score more goals with the greater uh, pace. So something else to kind of take a look into. And then I was just kind of um, looking around and, and kind of talking to some people and then sending out requests for thoughts and, and ideas and contributions. And uh, I messaged uh, Pierre Paget on, on LinkedIn the other day and just his thoughts that he uh, was a coach in the NHL at Calgary, Minnesota North Stars, um, Quebec Nordiques, and Anaheim as well. Um, and he was actually the GM with the Nordiques when they made the, uh, the famous or infamous trade. Uh, he, they drafted Eric Lindros and they made the swap that kind of uh, propelled the avalanche down the road uh, with Forsberg and a couple others. So, um, But just interesting to hear his perspective. He's in Europe now coaching and um, involved with the Austrian national team and something as far as uh, getting that sort of offensive flair and then that <coughs> That sort of system, um, you know, he's a big advocate of that and getting that sort of substitution. Overall, um, I, I'm just definitely an intriguing idea and concept to me, and something uh, definitely look into more and see what comes up. It's hard right now with uh, you know, Tampa Bay being the limited uh, team using this and trying to analyze it in that sense, but even be able to break it down between coaches and different things. Um, but overall, just, just the future impact and, and what we could use it for. And then again, thanks thanks to everyone here and then Scott and Diana who helped set everything up and um, you know, all the different sources and then people on the way. And I think that's it. Okay, just a minute for questions and we need to get into the next session. So okay. anything for us and uh, anybody has questions for Eric on? I'll try to get that website up if you want to grab the slides. Thanks, everybody. Sorry to rush you through. Oh, no, that's okay. Got a lot of information.